Whether it's because you're going through a heartbreak, you heard a particularly moving song, or you spilled some milk, we've all felt emotional enough to let it all go and have a good cry. But why is it that we cry when we're sad? Let's take a look at Brainyard. He's been having a rough time lately. His personal problems, relationships, and responsibilities have piled up to the point that he's feeling overwhelmed. But he's not gonna just sit around all day and cry about it. No, he's going to do what he does best. Research an effective way to relieve all that pent-up emotion and stress, and get back to his regular productive self. And it turns out the best way to do that might be to sit around and cry about it. Oh, yes, that's right. Our most primitive method of expressing distress may be the solution to some of our biggest problems. But to know why that is, we need to understand what the deal with tears is in the first place. Now, humans are no strangers to crying. As babies were basically brought into this world crying nonstop, and then managed to reduce that to a more reasonable uh, three hours a day? Fortunately for our parents, as we grow older, our tendency to cry drops, but never as low as you might think. On average, both men and women cry at least <laughs> once a month, and maybe more if This Is Us is on TV. Fortunately for us, tears are actually an incredible biological tool that are essential for human performance. Chemically speaking, they're made up of a lot of the same components as saliva, but there's a world of difference between your tears and your spit. In fact, there's a world of difference between your tears themselves. That's right, not all tears are the same. In fact, there are three distinct types of tears that we currently know about. The first type of tear is known as the basal tear. These are the most common of the bunch, and in fact, you're probably secreting them right now. Basal tears are comprised of an antibacterial liquid that keeps your eyes moist when you blink, and by doing so, they also help with your vision in general, as dry eyes tend to make things look blurry. Hey, eye saliva for the win! The next set of tears are called reflex tears. These are reactionary tears that are triggered by external irritants and are designed to flush them out of your eyes. Things like smoke, shampoo, and freshly chopped onions are all things that can trigger this kind of tear. Last but not least, we have emotional tears. These tears are special in that they contain more stress hormones than any other type of tear and are triggered by extreme emotion. While we usually associate emotional tears with sadness, they can also be triggered by feelings like anger, happiness, fear, and more. Usually when people talk about crying, they're talking about emotional tears. So that's what we'll be focusing on in this video. Perhaps because of its relation to unrestrained emotion, crying gets a pretty bad rap. Tears are often viewed as a sign of weakness, and as a result, people tend to hold them back. However, in doing so, they miss out on a ton of potential benefits. As a response to emotional distress, tears are pretty much the perfect mechanism for making you feel better. Have you ever noticed that when you decide to give in to your emotions and cry, you feel a soothing, calming feeling almost right away? That's because crying activates your parasympathetic nervous system, a part of your nervous system that's closely tied to relaxation. Emotional tears also release a hormone called oxytocin, which is colloquially known as the cuddle hormone, and other endorphins that are colloquially known as your brain's feel-good hormones. These ease any physical and emotional pain you might be feeling at the time, and uplift your mood so that you can feel more optimistic about your situation. In addition to stimulating positive chemical reactions in your brain, crying can be a way to rid yourself of toxins and stress inducers. Emotional tears tend to contain a way higher concentration of stress hormones in them, which kind of means that your body is literally draining your stress through your eyes. And while crying is an intensely emotional and cathartic experience, it can even better equip you to tackle the things that are making you cry. The entire experience of crying helps you to prioritize your life by making you subconsciously highlight the things that are important to you and the things you should be focusing on. And that's not all. Due to the whole relaxing, good feeling, stress relieving side of crying, people who are finished crying are better able to get a good night's sleep leaving them well rested and able to tackle their newly identified problems. Talk about an all-in-one solution. While crying may have a ton of reported physical health benefits, its effects are not restricted to the body. No, crying plays a surprisingly important role from a social perspective too. Did you know humans are the only animal that can cry? 
While other animals do produce various eye fluids, you've probably heard of the term crocodile tears. Humans are the only ones that shed liquid from their eyes when they're emotional. This seemingly odd ability may actually have played a significant part in the development of human evolution and society. You see, while tears are healing on a personal level, they also visibly display your distress and emotional state to others, which can help you get support and sympathy from the people around you. This is what's called an interpersonal or social benefit of crying. Practically, this is effective too as you may go from feeling isolated and alone in tackling your issues to having the support of a community behind you. Crying as a show of genuine vulnerability can really bring people together. It plays a crucial role in relationships too, as it helps to prevent fights from getting too out of hand. Seeing your partner cry can make you feel more compassionate or guilty, depending on the case. And it can help you snap out of the fight mode and back into a team first mentality. In general, it's more difficult to argue with someone who's crying, as it's a pretty strong trigger for your brain to tell you to back off. The effects of crying are so powerful that some people use it manipulatively to garner sympathy and trust, or to get their way. You see this most often in toddlers, who are basically experts at fake crying. And unfortunately, you sometimes see it in adults too. Now, a lot of what we've been discussing seems to pertain more so to sad tears. But is there a difference between sad and happy tears? Well, no. Emotional tears are all quite similar. And while they are rooted in different emotions, it seems the same form of catharsis is required. One theory of explaining this is that crying actually brings you back to your baseline state when you're experiencing intense emotions. So whether you're cripplingly sad or so happy you could burst, just have a quick cry and you'll be feeling yourself in no time. Of course, this doesn't mean that you should overdo it. Excessive crying is a sign of depression and if you find yourself crying frequently, uncontrollably, or for no reason, you might want to see a doctor. Now, if you're an actor looking to cry on command, there's a really good technique for doing so, although it may take some practice. All you have to do is recall a powerful memory that makes you feel a strong emotion. And you should feel the tears start to well up immediately. And if you can't think of such a memory, imagined sadness can be just as powerful as real sadness. Although actors somehow manage to look attractive while crying, most of us, well, don't. You know the look. Puffy eyes, runny nose, headaches, the whole shebang. But why does your nose run when you cry? Well, actually, your tears drain into your nasal passage before they ever flow out of your eyes. It's only when you produce too many that they start dropping onto your face. So, in a way, your runny nose is crying too. The headaches are a little more difficult to explain. Researchers aren't sure, but they think they're related to dehydration, you know, from all the fluids leaking out of your face, or from your body tensing up while you cry. So if you find yourself with a post-crying migraine, get yourself a big old glass of water and try to relax all your muscles. Hopefully, it will go away, and you'll have one less thing to cry about. While crying can be a powerful, cathartic experience, there is such a thing as a good or bad cry. Good cries tend to involve some kind of breakthrough moment, a feeling of understanding from the people around you, or a resolution that things will change moving forward. Meanwhile, bad cries tend to involve suppressed crying, a sense of shame, and an inability to express your feelings. While good cries make you feel really good, bad cries can actually make you feel worse. The difference between a good and a bad cry really seems to be rooted in your environment. If you're in a supportive, comfortable environment with friends, for example, you're more likely to feel safe and thus have a good cry. Meanwhile, if you're at work and you're being berated by your mean boss in front of your coworkers, crying is more likely to make you feel more miserable afterwards. So while you may not be able to control exactly when you cry, you should do your best to get to a safe space before you do it. When done in the right circumstances, crying can make you feel a lot better physically and mentally and can actually help you resolve the problems that were making you cry in the first place through a newfound sense of clarity and community support. It's the perfect biological tool for managing stress. Just look at Brainyard. So the next time you feel like crying, don't worry about the social or cultural implications. Just go for it. And no matter why you feel like crying, we'll be there for you with a big digital hug.
and more videos. Ciao for now.